Hey everyone, welcome to class 13 of Audio Midi 1, Spring 2022, Queens College, Copeland School of Music. So how's everybody doing today? I see we've got 12, so we've got two people who are uh, doing this class asynchronously, so we have most of the class here. I want to talk a little bit today about being creative and using these tools to create music. And I want to show you into a couple of things that I've done and talk about my methods and what I've, you know, just show you stuff technically, musically, whatever. So the first thing we're going to do is a couple of years ago, 1919, let's say. So that's three years ago. I took a, uh, I came into the city from up here and I went over to the High Line with my camera and I took a bunch of photographs and basically... What I did was I documented the walk I took. You know, I, I, I took the, uh, I probably took the bus to the city or the train. I forget which one. And anyway, I got out, let's say I took the bus and I got out of Port Authority. I walked down to 34th Street and then I just started walking down to 14th Street. I took some photographs and I got on the High Line at the southernmost uh, point of it. And then I just took photographs as I approached the area where I was, going up the stairs, and then walking north to the 34th Street Terminus. And so I got those photographs home, and I'll just show you some. And then I treated them inside of Photoshop, and I created this sort of photo essay, right? And I'll just go through this. This is before I got on, right? I just saw this cool graffiti. And this is something that I created, uh, and it's also uh, a part of a wall that I did some color treatment with, right? And this is something that I made, this cobblestone street, uh, into sort of like an oil painting. You know, and obviously I did some stuff there with reverse uh, exposure and some outlines. And so I did this because I wanted to crossfade from one into the other. Right, which, and I'll show you what I mean. And then this is the walking up the stairs. And then, you know, this is like oil paintings. And so I treated, I went through and I just took all these photographs, right? And I worked on them in Photoshop. And sometimes you'll see the same photograph twice. The second time, I've treated it a little bit differently. And the reason for that is like a crossfade from one into the other, and it gives it sort of motion, right? Like it's transforming into something. And then that's the end. So the next thing I did was I figured out a tempo, and I made a click track, and I printed out that click track, and then I imported the audio into iMovie because that's what I was using back then. I use a different video editor now. And I took all, imported all these pictures and then I put together a narrative using the still photographs like a documentary would. And there are all sorts of things you can do where you can give motion from, um, you know, you can have, like do the Ken Burns effect where the, you're sort of scanning across the picture and it gives sort of a sense of that there's a direction. And, excuse me, motorcycle sound of upstate New York okay um, and you can do all sorts of cool stuff so once I finished that film I exported that at, you know as a as a, a quick time movie and I imported it into Pro Tools and I've got a film right here that you know as I right you can see I'm just going Right. And what I did with that was I wrote a piece of music to that. Now, it took me an afternoon to take the photos. It took me an afternoon to edit the photos and put them into the timeline. And to write this four minute piece, it took me an afternoon. So basically three afternoons I put this together and oh, you weren't seeing those. I apologize. Let me do that again. 
So, uh, right, I'm just going through here. Right, you can see that it, I've, I'm just sort of scanning from, from frame to frame just so you could see some of those. So um, I'm going to play this now for you, and then we'll break down the track, and I'll show you what I did. Uh, let's do the actual size. Yeah, let's do this. Full screen. How's that? All right, here we go. All right, so um, 
you know, that's a pretty wild piece of music. I'm really happy with it. It's virtually all sample based, uh, orchestral libraries and other things and sounds that I made. So, in, yeah. Fantastic. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Sort of soloistic strings. Yeah. Uh, sound- that's fantastic. sampled library from a sample library. Right. Y- you know, this is something that I get into a little bit more in film scoring. When you get sample libraries, you have to write for them to make them sound good, which might not be what you would do if you were writing for a real player. Right? So you take advantage of the best part of that sample library and realize that not one sample library does everything that you need. And you'll need, so I've got solo string libraries. I've got probably about 10 of them that I pick pick from. Some might do spiccato better. Some might have a colenio patch that I really like. Some might have a beautiful legato that I like. Some might, might have, you know, a different mic perspective that I think is really cool. And where do I use those and how do I deploy them and what artistic point am I trying to make with that, you know? So that's sort of uh, learning. It's like learning how to play your instrument, right? I've got I, I, when I, I spent decades playing on a Yamaha U3 upright. I have now a Yamaha seven and a half foot uh, S7X, incredible piano. I can do things on that that I could never do on the upright. You know, I mean the sound of it, and and so therefore I touch it and play it differently than I do the the upright. Even though the upright was great for an apartment because I had the rehearsal pedal, and it didn't bother my neighbors. But you know, it's you have to learn how to play every instrument to its strong points. You wouldn't use a dobro to play, um, oh, I don't know, a Bob Dylan song. You'd use it to play a blues song. You know, it's it's just uh, nature of writing music. Okay, so there are some instruments here that I created. And um, there is a, uh, let's see, let me just hide that. In 268, there is a 1910 Steinway B. And that Steinway B was my te- one of my teacher, Saul Berkowitz, who taught at Queens College for 40 years. It was his first real piano after he and his wife got married. And I went in one afternoon that same summer, and I made a sample library of it. Okay, so that's this sound here. I've got it as audio. Right, so it's playing that. Um, yeah, so that's actually, that instrument is up on Piano Book uh, right now, which is a site to get free sounds. And uh, it's also made for decent sampler. Somebody somebody made it, I did it in contact, but somebody made a decent sampler program, which I just found out about, and it's actually pretty good. So, you know, you can find it there, Sal's Piano, it's called. Um, it's been downloaded like a thousand times, which is kind of cool. Uh, anyway, so I did that. And then there are these other things that I did also. Let's see if I can find them. Give me one second. Ah, here we go. Right. So there are some audio files I made one one morning. I was walking the dog and there was like a little f- pond that was frozen not far from here. So what I did was I used my phone with a little stereo mic I had and I tossed some rocks on the ice and then I played around with them. And then, you know, there's a lot of reverb and delay on them and some pitch shifting and time shifting. Right, so that's kind of cool, because you don't know what that sound is, right? So I played around with it using some of the techniques we went on with time shifting, time stretching, and, you know, there was a rhythm to it, and I just placed it in the spot so that it would work correctly. If you can take a look at, say, this one, for example. And this one here. Right, so there's a rhythm to that. Oops. 
boom, 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 right? So and then when you play all three of them together, you get a really cool composite. And nobody knows what that is, but that's a sound that I created and I'm the only person that has that sound, right? And that's another part of, of doing this stuff. So, okay, so now there are, um, let's just solo the strings here. Yeah, I did this really quickly, so I don't have this set up the way that I like, but we'll just, we've got all the strings right here. I'll just play them through. And so that whole thing was four tracks. And uh, wh I don't get what this is here, why this is not playing. It is playing. I don't know why I didn't hear it. Oh, okay. So we have this track here, which is playing these clusters. So if I open this up, right? Right, that's just one. So... You know, I've got sample libraries that do individual instruments and then stuff, they do effects that you can't really program. So that's part of building up a library of sounds is having these things. And then this right here is, uh, this one here is another one. Right, you can't really program that. That's actually, you know, if I played one note, You can hear how the sound unfolds over time. Right? That's not something you can program. And then these clusters, um, like if I were to play, and then if I were to play the spiccato then. So when you combine the three, all that together, right? You have a lot of articulations and that's one way that you can disguise that it's sampled based. If you don't let one sound happen for too long, then people don't notice that, oh wait, that last little bit didn't sound like real, you know? And that's the other thing. It doesn't have to sound real. It has to sound, actually sound good, you know? And that's different uh, depending upon what project you're working on. So again, I've got these three different sounds, four different sounds playing. And then the next time the strings come in is here. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Here we go with a solo cello right here. And again, because the solo cello is not playing a lot of notes and it's f being covered with those other articulations, you don't notice that it's sampled. And then when, it, when the, all those other articulations dissipate and you're left with just a single note, well, any, that sounds like somebody playing a note, right? You don't think it's a sample library. But let me just show you um, under the hood here, right? So there is, right, you can see this is, I'm looking at MIDI volume. So there's a couple of spots where I'm doing MIDI volume. There's a lot of spots where I'm doing mod wheel work because mod wheel gives us different uh, dynamic layers. Uh, there's work with expression. There's work with panning. So, you know, the stuff that I talk to you about as far as automation goes, I, I not only talk it, I believe it, and I, I do it, right? Right. 
and then we've got um, some interesting percussion stuff here. Let's let me play these. These are I made these into audio files. It's uh, let's see. It's this one here and this this one here. So let's just play those uh, solo those out. Okay, so how did I get this, right? Okay, let's say I, t I take this sound here, right? This is just a, a boom, right? Co I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to paste that right here just for, just for fun today. And I'm going to take a look at this. And then I'm going to do some audio editing here. So I'm going to tab to transient. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to delete this. I'm going to highlight this. And then I'm going to go to audio suite. I'm going to go to other. And I'm going to go to reverse. And then I can audition that like this. Well, it's going to take a while because it's a long piece of... Here we go. Okay. So I'm going to render that. And then you see here that it looks a lot like that. And then all I have to do is make sure that it snaps up against the grid here so that it ends uh, right where I wanted it to. And then this will be lower pitched than this one was. And then the reason that the sound uh, hangs over afterwards is I've got a reverb send and it's drenched in reverb. So I've got that in a couple of spots, and then there's another one of these up here. Right, that I turned into audio. So again, sounds that you don't know what they are, you, you do some sound designing in them. So that's kind of cool. And then here, let's see, I've got this... Uh, this is this software I use called Omnisphere. Um, it's a really good sam sample or playback, just plays back samples. It's got a huge library for it, and I, I like playing around with it. Okay, so here we've got a couple of things going on. We'll start with this track here, Pucker Up. You notice I'm only playing one note. Like, let me just play this again. But in the track, it sounds like this. Right? And that's because I've got that going through a, de a, de a delay, an echo. And so, and then that echo is going through another echo, right? So it, let me just get them both up. So this is like another technique where, that I do, where I have, if I were to just, let's say I bypass this one. Right, that's nice. And if I bypass this one. That's this one here. So, and then you combine them together. Right? It gives you that really cool rhythm. So basically doing sound design. Yeah, Adrian, that reverse snare was a big thing in the 1980s. <laughs> um, the Finer Things by Stevie Winwood has that in the... Uh, between verses, you can hear that. That's where I first heard it myself personally. Okay, so there's an element of sound design to my composition, right? Using effects to create rhythms and notes that aren't played. That's a big thing for me, you know. Um, that's, I don't know, I just find it to be really interesting and it, it just gives you something and just it's all you have to do is play around with it and you'll figure it out now with this particular sound here 
Uh, let's uh, make that bigger. Whoops, excuse me. So I'm going to mute all of these things here. Right, so it's just a little bell. So it goes through the black hole reverb where it keeps on playing. And then I have it going through this filter which takes off some of the high end. And you notice that the filter is moving in a step sequence. And then I have it panning back and forth following that and then I'm just taking off the low end so again using the effects to help with my spatial dispersion of the part you know moving it from left to right creating like a little bit of a rhythm with the panning so it's going dee da da dee da 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 right it's not just going dee da 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 it's also moving and that motion is part of the rhythm. And I don't overdo that kind of a thing. All right, hold on one second. So with this one, if we look at the filter, the mini filter... Wait, hold on a second. Oh, that's this here? I see what I did. Okay, hold on. Okay, so if we look at this filter right here also, we're going to see this move as well. Is that not doing that? Why is that bypassed? That is weird. Hmm, that's supposed to be moving. Well, anyway, enough of that. Let me move forward. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, another sound design. Right? You don't know, have no idea what that is, right? That was geese flying by me one day. I had my phone there, and I was taking a video of it, and I just took the, the, the sound, made it, and then I pitched it down an octave. And then, um, yeah, um, a slower panning, and it's going through the delay and reverb. So again, taking found sound and adding it to my sound, uh, to my palette. And then again... I've got the staccato uh, strings. Well, it's doubled with those winds, right? So that sort of will uh, mask. Right, so the strings are, are, are dominant in the sound, but the winds are there and they help it out. And then there's this weird patch here. With these sort of aleatoric rhythms. And hear how that fits into the whole. So if I just solo this patch here, and then we add these winds, this will be a cool texture. So that's, you know, that's orchestration, right? Where you're combining instruments together to create a very unique uh, texture. 
it's really cool. It's a great way to great way to think about that. You have like these uh, combinations of sounds, right? So that it becomes like a I have a, there's another word that I used to describe it, but I'm having a Halfheimer's moment right now and I can't think of it. <laughs> but I'll think of it in a minute. Okay, and then again, more sound design here with the slow motion geese. Like you have no idea what that is. And then we first have a pulse. So then right in here, we got our piano. Right, so do right, so if you're listening to just the piano, it's just doing those hits. But there's more happening because I've got this sound here, which are these pads. And they're also going through this delay. So if I turn the delay off, right, and that's cool with the piano, that adds more bite to the sound. But when you add the delay back in, you get the rhythm. And then we've got a, you know, a shaker loop here. And the piano's playing kind of like a Montuno. And then, again, changing the textures there, right? There are these low winds. And then more staccato winds over here. Right? And you hadn't heard anything like that up until that point. And then also the, the spiccato strings are doubling that high line as well. And then changing the texture immediately, right? It's like this kaleidoscope of changing textures, going from one thing to the next thing. And this keeps the ear from focusing too much in on one individual sound as being a sample. Uh, I find that to be very effective myself, personally. And then there's, right after that, those, that run, right, we've got this cello line, the solo line. And that, you know, I sort of program that in a way where you get the portamento on some notes and not on other notes. And that's something that you have to develop a little bit of a, an ear for. And then what was that? Uh, that bang. Oh, that was the tubular bell right here. I see. And that's actually pretty cool. I've got the tubular bell going through this really rich modulated reverb. It just goes on and creates a pad in the background, right? So I'm using reverb as an, an instrument, right, uh, to, to enhance the qualities of an instrument to make that tubular bell actually sound like like it's a, like it like it's a, like you're holding on to notes for a long time, and you have to be really judicious with that. It can't be everywhere, otherwise you'll make your track really muddy. So you know. Then there's this choir and these uh, high strings that are with very light touch. Well, they're not high, they're mid-range. So if I just listen to the choir... And then add that with the strings...
And then you got a composite sound. That's what I'm looking for, the word. See, I knew it would come to me. Where you add those two sounds together and that composite. Right, you see how that, that bell, the bell sort of fi finishes that? That's really, I, you know, that's just part of my orchestrational technique. I want to go to a new section here and I change the texture completely. And that bell helps me to do it. more choir there and notice you know the first time the choir comes in it's pretty thick and then it goes to a higher lighter texture so you know that's just another thing changing all the pitch registers really helps you out so I've got this low note here right and I'm doubling that Right, see how it's, this is answering and it's panning back and forth. And then there's the spiccato string in the middle of that. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then you've got these, uh, these strings again that we had with the choir but a different pitch register, so it has a different timbre to it. And then there's a lot of work here with the dynamics, right? There's the mod wheel, so you can hear that it's... and also expression. So it's going through different dynamic levels as well as volume. And I'm using kind of Aaron Copeland kind of chords there. And then what's cool there is the way that, for me, the way the textures change, right? So you've got this four or five bar phrase, whatever this is, moving up. And then time gets suspended a little bit. And here's a solo cello here. It's, again, not a lot of notes. And doing that work with the controllers. And then there's a this kind of different kind of bass timbre here. reverbs I've got on this one I've got three reverbs on this so I've got the black hole which is the big big sound long reverb I've got this 224 reverb which is like a modulated reverb sort of like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Harold Budd and Brian Eno's work but it's like on the Plateau album um, I really like that and then uh, this Pro R is just doing a, a concert hall and, a, and one delay well, this delay with two delay lines. So I've got three different kinds of reverbs. And um, I just make a decision based upon the kind of effect I want. Adrian, I don't really have a method for that, you know. So this section here is kind of a variation on the um, on this bit, right? Where you've got that sort of Cuban rhythm, and then we're over here, and it just gets transformed a little bit. And that's sort of my Stephen Reich ensemble. And then this is kind of cool with the marimba here, the way I do the rhythms. And then 
all three of those together and if there's delay on the, some of these. And it kind of swings, right? And then with that, you've got also the spiccato. And then this, this other string library. Let's solo that out. Right, it's sort of really weird. And notice it's doing a long crescendo. This is um, just a reprise of the beginning, right? There's that you heard that, but this time we've got those really strange chords there. You got that texture there. There's that reverse sound again, right here. to another rhythm. We've got this uh, composite sound of the marimba, the pad, this pad hit, and uh, a harp. Now we're in a different key. And we got piano. This time it's doubled with the that those pad hits that have a little bit of reverb uh, delay on them. I'm sorry, which gives you a little bit more of a rhythm. And then I start to change that pattern around here, right here. Right, so that it's constantly move. The music is constantly moving forward. You know, even when things repeat, it, it's changing and evolving. It's like a kaleidoscope. big bit to the end. Now, one of the reasons why I'm showing you this is... Um, I want to show you what's possible. It's funny because everybody talks, you know, if you, the word on the street is that Pro Tools sucks for MIDI. And while it's certainly not as advanced as some of the other software as far as MIDI goes, it's more advanced with audio, it certainly is capable with MIDI. I mean, this is a pretty complex piece of music and um, it's almost, it's, you know, 90% of it is done with MIDI. And then there's some audio tracks in there as well. Even the piano track was originally done with MIDI and then I just printed it as audio. Now, um, we're just, we're going to end a little early tonight, but I want to show you something. Just, I want you all to double check your projects. All right, and I'm going to show you why. Oops, excuse me. So let's say that this, I was handing this in as part of my final project. So, you know, I got this set up so that it will, you know, it's, set up the way I want I want it to be and I would do command shift W yes I'll save it's you know done I'm saving so I've closed this session right the session is no longer open so make sure your session is no longer open so this is the session folder for this I want you to make sure that when the session is closed if you've got audio files 
that there is an audio files folder that has all of your audio in it. If you have something that doesn't have an audio file in it, there's no folder after you've quit closed out, right? If you look at your session, you double check it and this, this audio and you close the session or quit Pro Tools and this audio files folder is not there, you've not imported the audio correctly. All right. And, and there's a fix for that. And let me show you the fix. All right. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to pretend as if, <clears throat> excuse me, there was no audio files folder there. It's Pro Tools is referencing those audio files from someplace in your computer. And if you send it to me, it's, I'm not going to be able to reference it. So you need to double check that and make sure that that is there before you hand in anything. And if you've already handed something in, double check it and make sure. And if you've, if it's, whoa, excuse me. Uh, not there. So then what you would do is if you needed to, um, if you don't have it in there, you're going to select everything, right? So you click on the top track and you go hold the shift key down and go all the way down to the bottom tracks so that every track that's in the session is selected. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go to the file menu and you're going to go to save a copy in. All right, and that's going to open up a new menu. And the items to copy, make sure that audio files are copied. Make sure that you, this is checked. Hit OK. Then you're going to navigate to your desktop and you're going to save this, whatever your, let's say that this is, uh, the name of this piece is Walking the High Line and then the underscore with the date. And then I'm going to put V2 at the end, right? And then let me just, uh, so I go to my desktop. Here it is, right? So if I open this up, you'll see that I've got an audio files folder in there and every one of those audio files has been copied. And then you can upload this, and it'll open up perfectly well in my computer. So I'm going to open this up. Um, I didn't copy the film, but if I open this up, uh, this will open up perfectly well. The film might not be in there. But you don't have to worry about a film right now. So the first time you open it up, it'll take a second because it's restoring the tracks. But the second, third time you open it up, it'll open up perfectly well. I don't know why it's doing that big thing. All right, there it is. Plays back perfectly well. You would just have to unselect everything, and then uh, you could save that, and then this is the one that you would upload. So that's how that would be fixed. So you got to make sure that you've closed, either quit Pro Tools or closed the session, and double-check that inside of your session folder, there is an audio files folder. All right, I had a three people hand in something last week that didn't have the audio files folder in there and I couldn't look at their projects. So this is how you fix that. And um, yeah, so I'm going to upload this video, uh, the second half of this video tomorrow onto YouTube and uh, I'm going to start going over your projects tomorrow. Um, hopefully there'll be a major vast majority of you that will have handed in something. But I'm definitely going to get up tomorrow and go over it uh, in the morning, like pretty early in the morning. So uh, you can certainly work on your project tonight. But, uh, you know, I want to, by 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to start going over these things. So are there any other questions? Uh, I, I had a question. I, I was, um, this morning I was looking for the the folder uh, in the OneDrive thing to upload it. And I, and I, I just, I, I, I made it, uh, I made it early this afternoon. Oh, okay. I'm. I'm. I thought I missed it. All right, great. I'll, I'll drop it in after class. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I. I thought that I had done it because I had done all the folders for my recording studio fundamentals class, but not for. I guess apparently I didn't do it for this class, but I did do it this morning, so not this, a problem. early this afternoon. So it's up there now. Missing something obvious. Thank you. All right, great. So everybody, uh, I'm looking forward to looking at your pieces tomorrow, and I'll give you good feedback videos so you can go forward from here. All right. Have a good night, everyone, and I will catch you on the rebound.
Thank you. Good night. Take care, Professor. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.